Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for information, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. This evening's session is The Heirs of Vijayanagara, Political Culture in 16th to 18th Century South India. The Heirs of Vijayanagara, Court Politics in Early Modern South India by Leonard Bess is a comparative study investigating court politics in four kingdoms that succeeded the South Indian Vijayanagara Empire during the 16th to 18th centuries. Ikkeri, Tanjavur, Madurai, and Ramnath. Building on a combination of unexplored Indian texts and Dutch archival records, this research offers a new analysis of political culture, power relations, and dynastic developments. The monograph provides detailed facts and insights that contest existing scholarship by highlighting their competitive, fluid, and dynamic, dynamic nature. It undermines the historiography, viewing these courts as harmonic, hierarchic, and static. Far from being remote, ritualized figures, we find kings and Brahmins contesting with other courtiers for power. At the same time, by stressing continuities with the past, this study questions recent scholarship that perceives a fundamentally new form of Nayaka kingship. Thus, this research has important repercussions for the way we perceive both these kingdoms and their quote-unquote medieval precursors. In this session, Anirudh Kanisetti will be in conversation with author Leonard Bess. The conversation will be followed by a Q&A session with the audience towards the end. Please feel free to use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, to post your questions, and Leonard will address them towards the end. The full bios of both our speakers will appear in the chat box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, with that, over to Anirudh. Thank you. Thank you, Lekha. And uh, thank you all for joining us on this uh, lovely evening. Um, let me just say at the outset uh, that The Heirs of Vijayanagara is possibly the greatest book that I have read about the Nayaka period um, in my entire life. And I'm sure that is going to have a tremendous impact on scholarship of the period um, for decades to come. So congratulations, Leonard, to begin with on this tremendous achievement. Um, I've been reading it uh, practically every day of the last month. And um, it is so exciting for what it for, for the way this kind of peels back this veil on what is arguably, I think, one of the most fascinating periods of South Indian history, and yet one that's paradoxically one of the least understood periods um, of the peninsula. Um, so to begin with, um, I'd like to set a little bit of context, right? So very often um, when we think about the Vijayanagara Empire, it, it's, it's very often believed that it ended, its history ended in 1565 um, with the Battle of Talikota. Um, but as Leonard shows through his book, um, emperors of Vijayanagara were very much contemporaries of the Mughals, and there were some emperors um, who were even contemporaries of Shah Jahan. Um, and um, simultaneously, the Vijayanagara kings were also um, the contemporaries of the Dutch and British East India companies. And I think, in fact, um, we will come to a discussion about the Dutch East India Company later because uh, Leonard does some absolutely fantastic things with uh, Dutch sources through the book. Um, so to begin with, uh, Leonard, what I'd like to understand is what do you, what do you make of this idea um, that Vijayanagara ended in 1565? Um, what, do you, what do we really mean when we say that the Naikas are the heirs of Vijayanagara? Um, and who exactly were these Naikas? Where in South India could they be found? Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's a lot of questions that, that I could talk about for hours. But very briefly, yeah, you're, you're entirely correct by saying that, uh, yeah, it is usually thought that after 1565, Battle of Talikota, um, Vijaya Nagara sort of vanished and then nothing much happens in the far south uh, until the British arrive. Eh? So it's sort of a blank spot or a dark period. Um, what happens in 1565 is, of course, that the, the, the Vijaya Nagara capital, um, yeah, this very glorious, amazing, rich place is, is attacked by um, the Deccan Sultanates. Um, the, the capital is raised. Uh, the court flees, um, but doesn't disappear. 
So they go to, uh, they, 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 they establish other capitals, Penukonda, Chandragiri, um, Velour, so more in the Andhra and Tamil speaking area. And they actually exist for about another century. And it's still a very important um, political and cultural focus point um, for other um, kingdoms. Um, but at the same time, yeah, its power does slowly uh, decrease. Um, and at the same time, uh, there, yeah, Vijayanagara actually fragments. Uh, and all these, yeah, former provincial governors all over the empire or local chiefs that were acknowledged and incorporated in, in the empire, they become more and more uh, independent and more and more powerful. And so while, while um, uh, Vijayanagara disintegrates, the successors, as we call them, Vijayanagara successor states, rise and become increasingly powerful. Some actually grow into very yeah, large, mighty uh, kingdoms, but at the same time, they still formally acknowledge um, yeah, the, 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 the superior status of Vijayanagara. And that's another reason why we call them Vijayanagara successor states, because Vijayanagara keeps on playing a yeah, sort of legitimizing um, role. Yeah, and then by the mid, mid uh, 17th century, this last capital of, of, of Vijayanagara, uh, much shrunk uh, Vijayanagara is, is finally um, conquered and the empire disappears. And that means that these successor states uh, in Karnataka, present day Karnataka, present day uh, Tamil Nadu mostly, um, yeah, become really practically speaking independent. So that's sort of the story. And then they flourish in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, yeah, before the British arrive. That is, that is very briefly the story of, of these Nayaka uh, kingdoms. It's, it's a, it, it really boggles my mind to, to try and think of them um, in, in a kind of historical perspective, free of all, a lot of our modern assumptions, right? Because um, Vijayanagara is very often thought of as this quote-unquote Hindu empire that falls to a quote-unquote Muslim coalition which yeah. isn't necessarily the case. And, and the reality of like who these Naikas were and how they would have seen themselves is, is, is quite different. And um, you said a little earlier about how the Naikas in some case are local chiefs who are assimilated into the Vijayanagara apparatus. And, and in other cases, uh, they are parts of the Vijayanagara imperial structure. And I think that's a very interesting point. And you kind of see that through the book, um, which once again, to, to, give, to give the audience context and with yet another recommendation that you read it, um, the book examines different aspects of like how the Nayakas worked, uh, from their court protocol to the role of courtiers to, of course, their relationship with uh, the Deccan Sultanates and the Mughals. Um, and it very systematically, and if I may so say so, very elegantly kind of goes through the evidence uh, that we have from every single one of these successor states, um, and then does a comparative study at the end of each chapter. Um, and that has a, it, I think it's a very powerful way of doing this because um, it allows us to get a, an insight into the regional differences between all of these kingdoms and shows that you can't really paint them all with a single brush. Um, hmm. The way that the legacy of Vijayanagara is, is taken forward by each of these kingdoms is different. And that depends also on their origins, um, both in relation to Vijayanagara and independently. Especially fascinating to me are uh, the Naikas in the Tamil country, um, including, of course, uh, the Naikas at Tanjavur, Madurai, um, and their offshoots, including the Setupatis, the Setupatis of Ramnad. Um, what's so fascinating to me is that these guys aren't locals. Um, they are actually Telugu warriors of the Balija caste, who are sometimes merchants and sometimes just peasant warriors. Um, who actually migrate into the Tamil region um, alongside Vijayanagara's expanding power and then kind of settle down there. Um, and they they bring with them this very kind of ornate, kind of classical courtly Telugu style, um, hmm. along with all the advancements and extraordinary developments in that culture that are happening in Vijayanagara. And then they continue it um, for generations after. And I think um, before you landed, of course, I think the most... Um, 
uh, important scholarship on, on this culture was by um, Velcher Narayan Rao and David Shulman, um, which made the argument that the that Naika kingship was very different from Vijayanagara kingship, right? That was much more interested in hedonism and in kind of showing the the, the public um, generosity and wealth of the Nayaka, um, and of course his his sexual prowess. And there was a tremendous role for um, courtesans and and the poetry that was written by courtesans. So, um, including some of the great classics, of course, of the Telugu literary canon. Um, so I'm curious. I mean, through all the work that you've done about the Nayakas. Um, what kind of impression do you have of them as people? Um, how do you yeah. think they saw the world and how saw their place in the world? Okay, that, that, that's again, um, yeah, actually a whole set of questions. So let me start by saying that, um, yeah, this, this, this 16th to 18th century South India was a very um, yeah, layered, complex, um, dynamic and cosmopolitan world. Eh? So, so there, was, there were these legacies of Vijayanagara. But um, all these successor states, these Nayakas, also looked back to earlier kingdoms. And they also tried to establish ties with smaller local kingdoms. Um, then there was, of course, a strong influence from uh, the Islamic world. And because these influences were mostly transmitted through the Persian language, we, we often call them Persianate influences. And then, of course, there was also the European presence, which, which also had some sort of impact, not so much as later, of course, but, but still already some impact. So you have all these different yeah, uh, spheres, all these different influences that come together. Um, and what you also see, you mentioned it too, there is a lot of migration. Um, um, there is a lot of new kingdoms being founded. Um, there, there is trade. So, so these these were very yeah, cosmopolitan, rich um, worlds, and of course that 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 led to all kinds of changes. Um, for instance, with regard to kingship. So, yeah, you refer to the work of uh, Velcheru Narayan Rao, David Schumann, and let's not forget Sanjay Subramanyam, who, with the three of them, wrote probably the most important book ever on. Um, the Nayaka states, at least those in Tamil Nadu. And for me, that book has been, yeah, everything. Um, something I had to, I have related to in, in many ways. Uh, I, most of the time I agree. Who, who, would, who would I be not to agree? Sometimes I slightly disagree, but that book is absolutely a milestone. Um, and one of the things you say is um, that, um, yeah, one, one aspect of, of the new kind of kingship there was sexual prowess. True. Uh, it was related actually to, to a growing attention in this period to the body, uh, to, to physical aspects, um, and the enjo enjoyment of physical matters. Uh, there's the term boga, physical enjoyment. Um, so that was, for instance, yeah, um, sexual adventures, but for instance, also the consumption of food. Um, I have not much to contribute to that aspect of kingship um, because the interesting thing is that uh, Rao and Schumann and Subramanyam actually um, yeah, constructed this new idea of kingship from Indian sources, which in a way is a bit ironic because usually it is being said that the Europeans wrote about Asia in an Orientalist stereotyping manner and in these european sources it was often uh yeah lust sex um harems you know those kind of things that were being uh, mentioned and exaggerated you know in european sources in this case actually that part comes from the indian sources and the interesting thing is that the dutch actually never write about such things um so what what uh, Rao, Schumann, and Subramanyam have done mostly is sort of um, yeah, write about kingship in a more general uh, way uh, as it appears from Indian literature, as you said, Telugu text, Sanskrit text, Tamil texts. Um, and they also write, write about these kingdoms um, 
yeah, in a more general way. So, so, so they sort of sketch this um, highly court culture um, and kingship. Um, what I've been doing, and that's why I think my book is an addition to their work rather than a correction. Um, I wrote about day-to-day -day politics. What actually happened? Uh, so if a king died and a new king had to ascend the throne, how did it work? Who played a role here? Um, also, I've really looked at the individual kingdoms um, to distinguish them. So, yeah, to, to summarize my answer, yeah, this was this was a new age, very cosmopolitan, very complex, very rich, um, in which many things changed, um, and there's still a lot that we that we can say about. It's still a lot that we have to research, and I've tried to yeah to contribute my part. Um, and in a way, it was high time because that, that previous book by uh, Rao uh, Schumann and Subramanyam, it's from 1992. So it's already 30 years old. So, yeah, I hope that yeah, I've contributed to this uh, yeah, field. I hope that sort of answers your, your long question. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, so yeah. another long question to follow up on that. And I think okay. that might not be a recurring theme throughout this discussion. Um, one thing that you briefly touched upon is this idea of bhoga um, and of the king's prowess um, in, 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 in sex, in food, and in, 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 in various other things as being a mark of, of his power and, and, and his exceptionalism, I would say, um, among, among humans. Um, and of course, you see that in various like titles of the Nikas and in, in which they practically describe themselves um, with, with amazing humility as gods on earth. Um, but what also struck me about this was this is extraordinary sense of continuity. Um, and they seem to also be picking up from elements of medieval Indian court culture, which is, of course, an area that I focus on. So 500 mm -hmm. years before this, 600 years before this, um, the Manasolasa, which is a text written in the northern Deccan by the Chalukya king Someshwara III, already divides the activities of the king according to bhoga um, and it 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 it, it talks and uh, talks about the bhoga of, of 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 food it talks about the bhoga of course of sex um, and all these things so it, it really is quite remarkable to see how that that thread seems to carry itself through those many many centuries while absorbing these influences from all these new kind of contacts and new kind of cultures that are coming into southern India, especially the Persianate cultural world. Um, and then we see them um, flourishing and blooming in the, in the 17th, 18th centuries from the eyes um, of the Dutch, of all people. Um, yeah. And you, you, <laughs> all really people, yeah. To, <laughs> you really have to think, you know, what would the Chalukyas have thought of all of this, of like yes. all these like completely unimaginable influences um, and it, it really goes to show like how, how remarkably globalized I suppose for lack of a better word the Nika polities are I yeah. think one of my one of my favorite images in your book um, is of one of the Setupatis of Ramnad um, entertaining uh, I think a Dutch official in, in, in the palace you know and I think you mentioned it's um, on one of the inner doorways like leading into the private sections of the palace yeah. um, and it's so striking because it shows a king in what what we can perhaps call a quote-unquote classical Indian costume where he's got his heavy pearl necklaces um, and he's just wearing a dhoti and you know he's otherwise shirtless and he's got all the uh, marks of Shiva on, on, on his forehead and his arms and all that and then there's this European gentleman um, wearing a top hat and, and a coat um, and it's, it's just such a striking and they don't see clearly they don't see a contradiction in this right they won't necessarily have seen this as somewhat surprising and um, I mean, sorry, I know there's a bit of a this is a slightly a slightly rambling question, but I mean, um, as 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 a, as an Indian millennial um, who has been wearing uh, trousers and coats my entire life, um, it is just so striking to see like th this painting in which this Indian man seems so at home wearing this lungi or dhoti that is the European and the European costume that seems out of that seems out of place in India. It's, it's just a, one of those striking little details in your book. But yeah. to come back to the question, uh, really, um, I suppose it's it's two-sided. The first is, um, how did the Naikas engage with legacies before Vijayanagara? I mean, of course, it goes without saying that 
as former Vijayanagara officers, as chiefs allied to Vijayanagara, that they would look to Vijayanagara for inspiration and legitimacy. But did they also look to early Indian kingdoms? Did they see themselves as being part of, of, of older kind of historical trajectory? Um, and secondly, um, since I mentioned also the Persian at world, and you also mentioned the Persian world they're interacting with, how did they see the Persian world and where were they taking influences from? Now, we know that Vijayanagara was competing with other Deccan sultans, and you have the Vijayanagara kings calling themselves sultan among Indian kings. Um, but was that necessarily the case for the Nayakas? How had the world changed for them after yeah. the fall of Vijayanagara? Yeah. Again, again I, can, I can speak for a long time about this. Um, it will probably also, well, even more rambling. My answer will be even more rambling than your question. Um, okay, so so basically what you're saying is, uh, yeah, what, what I also just said. So you have, you have, this, you have this older Indic tradition uh, you have the Persianate influences, um, and then you have the Dutch. And, and, and how does it sort of come together? Um, well, it does. So you mentioned the Mana Solasa, which refers to um, Boga. It also refers to lots of other things, like, for instance, a court protocol or rituals, who has to be where, who can sit, how close can you come to the king, etc. So that works like those were very influential. So the Mana Solasa is from the 12th century. It's a Sanskrit text of the Chalukyas of Kalyana. Um, but large parts of it were yeah, copied or yeah, uh, were an inspiration. For instance, an 18th century work, the Shiva Tattva Ratnakara of one of the Nayakas of Ikeri in Karnataka. Eh? So we know that these older works like Mana Solasa were still relevant, uh, were still influential. Um, so that is an example of these older um, yeah, influences, Indic traditions that, that still flourished. Um, if, I, if I could just also leap in uh, here to add, yeah, yeah, just one more question here, Leonard, because um, about history as well, right? I think you mentioned that one of the Maratha rulers of Tanjavur, and again, we take that for granted today, but think of what a strange set of historical events led a Maratha to be ruling in Tanjavur of all places. Yes, um, yes, yeah. And he uses the title Chola in one yeah. of his inscriptions. Um, so what can we say about how they saw their the, 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 the past uh, beyond Vijayanagara? Yeah, so so that's, of course, another example. So at one point, uh, the Nayakas of Tanjafur um, are, well, to keep it simple, they are being replaced by the uh, by the Bonsles, the Maratha Bonsles from Maharashtra, of course, Maratha speaking, they become the new kings of, of Tanjafur. Uh, but they're, of course, aware of the fact that Tanjafur had been, for for centuries, had been the capital of the Kaveri Delta, which was always the heart of the Chola Empire, right? Uh, yeah, let's say half, half a millennium earlier. So to, yeah, to sort of justify or to, to indicate that now they rule this territory, they would also include the term Chola uh, in their titles. But that, that happened all the time. Um, but, but to continue to the first question, so you have you have the Indic tradition, like for instance the Mana Solasa and ideas about um, court protocol. Then there is the Persianate influence, which which you asked about. So you said, okay, we know that Vijayanagara adopted uh, certain um, practices from the Islamic world, like for instance titles. True, they called themselves uh, Suratrana. Uh, Hinduraya, Hindu, which you could Hinduraya translate, uh, yeah, which sorry, sorry, yeah, which you could translate as Sultan among Indian kings. Um, they also adopted, for instance, dress, uh, long coats, high conical caps. They adopted that from from uh, the Islamic world, um, and this is where the Dutch sources come in, um, both for the Islamic Persianate influences and the older Indic traditions, because. Um, for instance, in reports of Dutch embassies, eh, diplomatic missions to these courts, they, they record what they were experiencing. So one thing they, for instance, recorded is that um, the Setupatis of Ramnath or the Nayakas of Madurai were wearing what the Dutch call Moorish clothing. So that refers more or less <laughs> uh, to Islamic clothing. Eh? So... So these observations by Dutchmen tell us 
oké, okay, this, 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 this uh, Persian influence, for instance, in royal dress was still continuing. What you also see in these reports of Dutch embassies to these courts is that all the rules about court protocol that are mentioned in a text like the Mana Solasa, these rules um, still existed. Yeah? So the, the Dutch encountered, they experienced these rules. So for instance, were they allowed to sit? Um, or had they, did they have to stand? How close could they come to the king? Could they sit on his left side? Could they sit on his right side? There were all these rules, also ideas about what kind of gifts you have to give, eloquence, yeah, all these aspects of court protocol. It was very clear, um, it is very clear from the Dutch sources that, that, that this was still existing. Um, what the Dutch have to contribute in this particular case is that um, even though the rules were mostly the same as the period uh, of the Mana Solasa, these rules could be followed, but they could also be broken. Eh? So the Mana Solasa is basically yeah, a normative text. It, eh? Well, at least the part about the audience hall, for instance, it tells you how things should be done. Doesn't mean that it always happened that way. Eh? So that's where the Dutch sources contribute and tell us, yeah, the rules were also often broken. Um, and there, people were actually being offended all the time, deliberately because it's a way of showing your annoyance. And yeah, unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for historians, these courts and the Dutch actually, yeah, often annoyed each other <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't have the same interests. So there was a lot of conflict going all the time, uh, but that's good because it provides us with sources and descriptions. Yeah, I hope that sort of answers your question and brings it all together. I mean, it does for me. Uh, I hope that the, the audience will also agree with that assessment. Uh, once again, just uh, since we've reached the halfway mark of the discussion, a uh, reminder to the audience that please put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to them in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so I think Lam, this is actually a good, good time to um, move to actually talking about the Dutch themselves and what precisely uh, they were doing um, in South India at the time. Mm, um, yeah. I think, um, especially given your experience with working in, in the Netherlands uh, National Archives. Um, I'm curious, like, um, do you have any interesting stories from the archives? Did you, are there any particular uh, um, VOC officials whose stories you found particularly fascinating? Are there any documents that, um, that, 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 that you found interesting to kind of handle and kind of work through? Yeah, um, um, sure. Well, let, let me may, maybe first start with very briefly describing this Dutch presence in South India. So, so they, let's say, arrived around the year 1600, stayed for about two centuries. Um, they were mostly in the, in, the, in the areas of the Vijayana successor states to, to, purchase, to purchase textiles, which were in great demand in what we now call Indonesia. Um, and in Ikiri, they were mostly there because they had to buy rice to feed their personnel. Um, so they were there for trades. They didn't really have a desire to conquer lands because that was expensive and it was also not necessary. So you should see the Dutch really as traders, mostly staying at the coast, sometimes, well, no, not sometimes, very often actually in contact with the courts, uh, exchanging um, people, uh, correspondence, um, goods, ideas. Yeah? So there was actually a very intense contact all the time. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the Dutch were not a colonial power. Yeah? So, so they could observe things, they could not really influence things. So I always feel that um, in their records, um, it was important for the Dutch to, to write down how they thought the situation was. Yeah, for instance, um, if the Dutch wanted to conclude a new treaty with a court, it was important for them to know, okay, who is the most uh, influential person at the court? It might not be the king, it might be actually someone else. Um, so we need to know what is the political situation, the political setup of this court, because we know, we, we want to know whom we should get in touch with. So yeah, there were these observers at, at the coast, looking at these courts and trying to find out, okay, what is what is going on? What is the situation? So that makes these Dutch archives 
very useful. And I should also say there is a lot. So only for South India, you really talk about hundreds of meters, eh, like, like in a library, hundreds of meters of, of documents, handwritten documents that for the most part have not been read by anyone since the Dutch East India Company went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, wow. So all these records are still there, um, partly in the Netherlands, but for instance, also in the Tamil Nadu archives in, in Chennai um, and at other places. And these are very important sources. And you ask me, is there one story that comes to mind? Um, yeah, and maybe it's 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 it can also serve as an example of how um, yeah, how intense the relations could be between these Dutch and these courts. So the story uh, I think of is uh, concerns the court of Ramnat, eh, where the Setupatis were ruling. And somewhere, sometime around the mid 18th century, um, there was a Setupati king, but he was a little boy. So obviously he was not actually ruling the kingdom. Who was actually ruling the kingdom was a general, um, a Dalavai, as we call it. Um, his name was Vaida Vanata, Ser Vaikarar. I hope I pronounce it more or less correctly. Um, but he was basically in power, which, which is very clear from, from what the Dutch wrote. But there was also the mother of that king. Uh, she was a widow. Yeah? So the previous king had died. His little son had come on the throne, being dominated by this general. And there was the, the, the queen mother, uh, the king's mother, who really didn't like the situation. Um, and she was sort of, yeah, building another court faction um, to go against this general. Um, and one thing she did when one of the Dutch ambassadors was actually staying in the capital, Ramnathapuram, during his mission, she tried to contact, uh, so the mother sort of secretly tried to contact this Dutch ambassador um, and, 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 and also asked him to visit her, which is quite interesting already. So you have this Dutchman visiting this, this, this queen mother. And then she told him that um, after a conversation, she told him, yeah, I consider you my son. Um, meaning, she explained that the Setupati king on the throne is your little brother. And it means you have to protect him. Um, so in a way, she, she, she incorporated that Dutchman into the Setupati dynasty, you could say. Uh, and, and that supposedly came with obligations, you know. So what she tried to do is sort of win the Dutch for her. Um, and she was hoping that they would, yeah, could be a counterweight, you know, uh, against, against his general. Well, of course, the Dutch were totally unaware of, you know, that this was, I mean, they knew about the power struggle, but they didn't knew, know that they had now sort of, been incorporated in the dynasty and yeah that certain expe expectations um existed but but yeah to me i like this story because it it explains so many things it tells us about these court politics and how these courts were very dynamic and yeah uh, leka already uh yeah read about this in in her introduction this is on the cover of my book that these that these courts are very dynamic and 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 competitive. Um, so this very clearly, um, yeah, very comes very clear from this story, but it also shows you yeah, how the Dutch, yeah, how intense the relations, the relations were between the Dutch and these courts. So yeah, that's a story I really like. That's, yeah. uh, that's <laughs> a very, that's a very interesting story to me because also there's, it reminds me of this story that's also told about um, Ramaraya, um, one of the last uh, Vijayanagara rulers to actually rule from the city of Vijayanagara, where um, the young Sultan of Bijapur, Ali Adil Shah I, um, actually came to his court and yeah. Ramaraya's wife declares that this young man is like a son to me. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if that was also Ramaraya's way of trying to kind of symbolically appropriate Bijapur into the Vijayanagara empire and kind of declare yeah. himself the the primus uh, inter Paris, as it were, uh, of, of the of the sultans, considering that he also called himself a sultan in a way. Yeah, um, I'm I'm aware of this. I'm aware of this story, and I think it is it is more or less the same case. Eh? So this is a way of, yeah, establishing 
fictitious family relations. And you do that to, to sort of bind people, you know, to you. Yeah, so they, yeah, they have obligations toward you. They, they can no longer attack you. They should help you because after all, this person is your son, symbolically perhaps, but still your son. So yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure if I ever thought of this uh, similarity between these two cases, but, but I think it's exactly the same. So what you see is that, yeah, the Dutch are, are incorporated in this Indian world. Maybe another example is um, at one point there is a clash between the Dutch and uh, some troops of the Nayaka of Madurai. It's, it's a little, it's not a very big clash, but um, among the Dutch soldiers, there's a particularly um, yeah, strong, um, powerful soldier who um, on his own kills lots of soldiers. In the end, he's, the Dutchman is killed himself, um, but the Madurai troops are so impressed by, by the, yeah, the, uh, the skills and the, and, and, and the bravery of this soldier that they take this Dutch guy from the battlefield um they chop off his head um because on the one hand they want to show yeah we have we have defeated this mighty warrior but then they bolt they embalm the head and they incense the head and with music and dancers and whatnot they return it to the dutch yeah? so this is also yeah very two-sided so on the one hand they want to show the dutch hey we have we have defeated your your strong soldier but we also really respect him and we return his head in a yeah you know in a respectful way for me it's it's very typical of how the dutch are incorporated in this indian yeah environment uh, and that there are always different sides to 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 every event yeah absolutely that's actually one of my favorite incidents from the book and um, to our audience, the book is full of incidents like this, and they just add this color and texture to the Nayaka courts that doesn't very often come across in Indian sources, right? Because Indian sources, if they're epigraphical, tend to be focused on, you know, just these formulaic recitations or rulers' titles, and of course, those contain some historical value, but they don't really tell you a lot about the people who commissioned that inscription, the kind of lives that they were leading day to day, um, which I think that you do a great job in kind of bringing to, to, to life. Um, and to, to, to your point about how the Dutch are kind of incorporated into the Nyaka world, you like pretty seamlessly, right? There, there isn't a lot of friction. Like as soon as, as soon as, you know, the Dutch embassy start to arrive, they, they have this, okay, they're like, okay, you know, let's, let's give them a robe of honor, you know, let's incorporate them into a court in this particular way. They're not necessarily sitting and trying to figure out, oh, will the Dutch be offended? They're like, okay, this is how we do things. Welcome to our world, yes, as it were. Um, and I just find that very interesting because um, if you were to go back to earlier, right? So we're, look, we're looking at early modern India at this point, but if you were to go back to medieval India, um, you see that very similar things happen, of course, when you have um, Muslims um, emerging to political power in the Deccan for the first time, where there isn't, I mean, of course, there is violence and there is conflict and there is friction, all the other things between um, between these groups, but there's also this almost immediate kind of recognition um, that, okay, these guys are warriors like us, and let's incorporate them into our warrior culture. So I think if you were to look at um, uh, the Madhura Vijaya, which is, I think, a 14th century Vijayanagara text, which talks about how uh, they conquered Madurai from, from the Madurai Sultanate, they're mm. praising the Turks for their marital valor and like how they were fighting the martial valor, sorry, um, and how, how, how they are great warriors and so on. Um, and that's, I think that's, it's very significant, I think, that this it does not seem to have been necessarily a religious thing. No. Um, it seems that commonality is very often found in political interests and economic interests um, and cultural accommodations are found through that. And there isn't necessarily a lot of factionalism, um, at least on the basis that we would expect given our modern politics, right? Um, you have this very interesting passage in your uh, section on courtiers um, where you say that... Um, except for like one instance where Telugu's very clearly form a faction against a Tamil general being appointed, there's there are barely any cases of like linguistic groups forming rivalries or of religious groups forming rivalries or even castes forming rivalries. The court factions seem to cut across these kind of narrow interests. Um, and I found that to be like a really fascinating point, how it, it it's not really a leap for them. 
uh, to be incorporating the Dutch into all this. And I think it also supports yeah. um, your point about how dynamic these these courts could be. Yeah, um, no, I totally agree. And yeah, this is, of course, a topic that uh, especially Richard Eaton and uh, Philip Wegener and also others have written about. So it's it's maybe not so new, although, yeah, I, I found the same patterns at, at, at the courts that I looked at. But uh, you, you just mentioned Rama Raya, the last, yeah, the last uh, ruler, practical ruler of Vijayanagara before the Battle of Tadikota. Um, and he is he is often seen, yeah, as some kind of Hindu champion because, yeah, he was defeated in this in this battle of 1565, which is often perceived as as a battle between, on the one hand, Islamic sultanates and Hindu Vijayanagara. But um, it, yeah, that is definitely not the whole story. And 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 uh, one thing which is important to realize, for instance, is that Rama Raya actually in his younger uh, days was a warrior fighting for Golconda. Eh? Yeah. So, so there you go with your religious affiliations. That, exactly as you say, that was often uh, rather unimportant. I, I wouldn't say it never played a role, but but it was not the main thing that determined everything. It's exactly as you say, uh, people would have shared political interests and that, um, yeah, determined political events. So, yeah. I was actually planning to say this myself, but then you already included it in your question. But true, I've I've been studying courtiers and court factions at the Nayaka courts, um, partly from Indian sources, partly from Dutch sources, uh, and you can reconstruct yeah whole careers, and you can reconstruct various groups at the court that were competing with each other, and never ever uh, did I come across a clearly defined religious faction. So, um, yeah, let's say Hindus against Muslims. No, you would see factions or, or alliances of networks of various Hindus, as far as we can use that word in that in this period. But let's say, yeah, the number of Hindus and a number of Muslims together uh, competing with another faction also composed of, of Muslims and Hindus. You know, that 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 was very normal and that linguistic uh, event that you mentioned, so Tamils against Telugus, yeah, that, that's the only case I came across where you have like a clear uh, division of faction based on, on something like language or caste or religion. Um, and so anyway, this, this, was, this was a competition between two groups of Hindus. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Telugu speakers, Tamil speakers, but all Hindus. So also within religions, you could have very strong competition. So yeah, there was there was actually almost nothing in my research that pointed to religion playing a very important part in, in politics. No. But um, I'm not I sure if I convince, can convince no, everyone of that. <laughs> that I, I, I find that answer fairly convincing. And of course, um, the book is much more emphatic in like marshalling the evidence to support this argument and um, the audience can feel free to read it at their leisure. Um, but I think that's actually a very good uh, note to segue to taking audience questions, um, Leonard. And it, it turns out that you and I were not the only people who are um, who want to make a point about um, worldly interests uh, visa versus religious feelings and factionism. I see uh, Prabhu Mudlapur actually asked that exact question. Uh, so congratulations, Prabhu, on preempting um, both of us. Um, one very interesting question from Ajay Kumar BS. Uh, let's take this. So um, when Shivappa Naika from 1645 to 1660 was at the helm of affairs at Bidanuru, the capital of the Akira Naikas, he got rid of all the factories along coastal Karnataka belonging to the Portuguese. This was the crucial time when Shivappa gave enough opportunities to the Dutch to carry on trade with the Kerry as an alternative to the Portuguese. We have two cannons and two church bells manufactured at Rotterdam Foundry in Bidanuru in a very good condition, which were gifted to Shivappa by the Dutch embassy. I wanted to know, other than rice, timber, iron, and spices, what all firearms, gunpowder, and rockets were being exchanged between the Dutch and the Kerry? Um, yeah, thank you for this this interesting question. Uh, someone who is clearly very, um, yeah, 
aware, uh, well aware of Ikeris history. Um, I'm not sure if I was aware of these Dutch bells. Um, so I would be interested to, to hear more about that, but to come back to your question, um, the Dutch never really traded large numbers of, of, of weaponry with Ikeri, but uh, weapons were often part of the gifts um, given by the Dutch to the Ikeri court and also to the other courts, uh, by the way. So, so for instance, triple barreled, barreled guns or very special swords or whatever, they were often gifted by, um, uh, by the Dutch to these courts, including Ikeri, um, but not large numbers of, of weapons. Uh, no, that didn't happen. That's uh, quite interesting. I hope that answers the contrast. question. Um, yeah, I hope so as well. Um, <laughs> so I, that's that's quite interesting, Landry. I think it, it's it's quite a contrast to, let's say, the British and the French, who were very often actively working as mercenaries and as arms dealers. Um, and I think it bolsters an earlier point uh, that you made about how the Dutch couldn't influence um, things, really. They could, at best, observe them. And I'm hoping that this this leads to, yeah, because I think the, the unique kind of um, lack of a power dynamic, in, in a sense, between them and Indian courts, makes them much more objective observers of how these courts worked in practice um, than British or French embassies. Yeah, well, um, if, I if I may... If I may interrupt, I think it, it depends for, very much on the period. So in the period when the Dutch are still there, uh, let's say until the 1750s, 1760s, before that period, you also have the British and the French. And I think they they have the same level of power at that time as the Dutch. And so so that, that strong political influence, uh, for instance, the, the British start to dominate Tanjavur and also Arcot. That is really something of a later period. And so I'm not saying, oh, the Dutch were the nice guys. They were just there for trade and, and the British and the French were the bad guys. Um, it really depends on the, on the period you look at. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's no, something fair. I wanted to say. That, that's a completely valid point. Um, but like, I particularly enjoyed the bit where you talk about the various embassies that went to the court of Mysore under uh, Chikadevaraya, uh, Wadiyar, and how you point out how Though very often we dismiss Dutch sources as being, as being biased because they depict a lot of Nayaka courts as being like these kind of like viper pits of like intrigue and like factionalism and like power struggles at all times. They depict the court of Mysore, even though they weren't, they didn't succeed in doing business with the court of Mysore. They still depict it as being a fairly like well-run place, you know, with like efficient courtiers, people who are actually being rebuked for begging for bribes and a slightly eccentric king. I think that, that's the term you use. Um, and again, that's a very elegant way of pointing out how you can establish that Orientalism doesn't always have to be the lens through which we interpret even European sources. And sometimes we can use them as valuable um, bits of objective information. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was maybe the biggest challenge for me uh, when writing this book. Um, what to do with the, these Dutch sources. So to what extent are they stereotyping? To what extent um, are they full of misunderstandings and, and Orientalism? So that was certainly a challenge, but um, yeah, I, I think, so So what I really tried is um, combine Dutch sources with Indian sources. So let's say if, there's, if there was an event for which I have a Dutch source, and, a, and an Indian source, or let's say if there's a person for whom I have Indian sources and Dutch sources, then I would bring these sources together, which provides context for both of them. Um, and you can come to a more nuanced conclusion. So um, of, co of course, these Dutch sources had all their drawbacks. I mean, they can be really uh, orientalistic. Yeah, they, 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 sometimes it's clear that the Dutch misunderstood things or they you find out that uh, some lower placed Dutch officials were trying to hide things for their superiors. Um, and you only find out much, much later that this story that you read some months ago in the archives cannot possibly be, be true. Um, but on the whole, yeah, if you are aware of these drawbacks, you can also sort of work around them. 
especially when you combine them with um, uh, with Indian sources. And exactly as you explain, there was one Dutch embassy to the Wodeyar court of Mysore. Unfortunately, only one, but it's a it's a it's a wonderful report. And um, yeah, and it's it's quite positive or at least quite neutral objective about the court eh? because there were no different interests already. Eh? So yeah, the Dutch just arrived there and they just, just describe what they see. And they're actually quite positive about the court and about the king and the courtiers, even though the king asked them to sing <laughs> Dutch songs because he was so curious about these strange people that he had never, never seen before. And I was a bit... Yeah, I felt a bit embarrassed to read that the Dutch refused <laughs> to sing. <laughs> and then later I found out the Jesuits or certain Jesuits got the same request from the same king. And the Jesuits were totally happy to sing for him. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's not so good for the Dutch reputation, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that did read like a very embarrassing situation with Dutch. I mean, I'm just imagining you know, the Dutch like blushing and refusing to sing and just standing there awkwardly until... I think the king's uh, general comes in, his fa his father-in-law comes in and changes the subject. Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's move on, guys. Yeah, yeah. It's very amusing. It's very funny. Yeah. Um, so one um, one little question about uh, interesting question about day-to-day -day life. Um, what was or were the main language or languages in which court records were kept, and which calendar or calendars was or were used for contracts? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, for the languages, well, so what is also what points to the to the yeah the the the, the very cosmopolitan character that, that I already mentioned is that all these courts had different languages. Yeah, so of course they all used Sanskrit, but for instance in Ikiri there was Sanskrit and there was also Kannada. Um, in these Nayaka courts in the in the Tamil zone there was Tamil, Telugu, Sanskrit. Um, of course, Tanjavur later also started using Marathi eh, because, because the new dynasty came from uh, the Marathi speaking part. So all these languages um, coexisted. Many of them were simultaneously patronized by the, by the kings. Eh, and there are even texts in which all these languages come together, you know, and, and, and in the text, in the story, in, in, in the court text, uh, they cause a lot of confusion. Eh? So, so Authors also played with these different texts. So, so that's really interesting. Um, as for the calendar, that's a very good question. So I think um, the question was about the contracts. Yes. Well, we do, we still have the Dutch contracts because they're part of the archives, of course. There you simply find um, yeah, the Christian calendar. So it is 1632 AD or something like that. Um, we usually don't have the Indian, um, how do you say, counterparts uh, in the local language. So I can't say, but what I do know from, from inscriptions, uh, so the Indian sources, is that they often use the Shaka calendar, yes. so which started in 1778 uh, of the Christian era. But I wouldn't be able to say if, if other calendars were also used. Yeah, but I don't think the Christian, or I don't think the, the Nayaka courts would use the Christian calendar themselves. And sometimes I think they also actually use the Islamic calendar. Sometimes you also see references to, uh, yeah, to that calendar. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, the first, um, in the Nayaka period, what were the political and economic relations between the heirs to the Vijnagar Empire and the Muslim polities in the rest of India, including the Sultanates, the Mughal Empire, Hyderabad, and so on, throughout the period before British ascendancy? Were they so, how were so what were their relations? What were the relations between the Sultanates and the Nayakas, simply put? Um, and um, it's by Vijay Rao, so he's also curious whether they were hostile due to the fall of Vijayanagara, or whether they were more accommodative and collaborative? More collaborative and accommodating than Vijayanagara towards these sultanates? Is that is that the question? No, I think he's asking, did did the fall of um, 
Oh, sorry, I think we have. I we actually have quite a bit more time. Actually, um, sorry. So I will. <laughs> so I can come back with more rambling questions. Uh, fantastic. Um, no. So Vijay is asking. Um, did the fall of Vijayanagara lead to hostility between the Sultanates and the Naikas, or um, were the Naikas even more accommodated as a result of the fall of Vijayanagara? I think in that sense, nothing much changed. I mean, it's. I think before the fall of Vijayanagara and after the fall, uh, you just have these this whole constellation of kingdoms that all want to expand their power, um, you know, and, and, and wage wars or conclude alliances. Um, I think nothing much changed. What you generally see is that, of course, these Vijayanara successor states were less powerful than the Vijayanara empire as a whole. So many of these Naika kingdoms um, have to pay tribute to these uh, sultanates that are generally yeah, more powerful. So for instance, Ikari uh, became tribu tributary to Bijapur. Uh, that is something we know. And for instance, also Arkot, uh, an important state that started as a sort of Mughal empire offshoot, but became increasingly um, independent, uh, starts to dominate uh, especially Tanjavur, um, also Madurai to some extent. Um, yeah, so so you could say that for a while these Islamic states, well, let's say Muslim ruled states, it's a, it's a better uh, description. Um, yeah, are are sort of dominating these Vijayanagara successor states, but but don't annex them, don't annihilate annihilate them. Um, yeah, so so that's. That's sort of, of the situation. So you could say that some of these Vijayana, Vijayanaga success states became vassals of these sultanates. Yeah. Um, same with the Mughal Empire. Of course, the Mughals under Aurangzeb conquer uh, Bijapur and Golconda um, and then become actually the neighbor of these Vijayanaga successor states, but don't conquer them. I'm actually not sure why they didn't do that. Maybe that was a bit, yeah, too difficult. So, yeah, there is, there is, there are demands for tribute that actually the Nayaka states don't always uh, respond to. So it's sort of an ongoing, um, yeah, yeah, relationship of negotiations. I hope that more or less answers the question. There was another interesting story that you mentioned, Leonard, about um, the, the supposedly this the story told about this Ikeri Nayaka who. Um, who I think he renounces his kingdom and he then just wanders North India. Um, yeah. And he happens to enter the court of Delhi, which would have been the Mughal court, um, where supposedly there's this minister who is so powerful that he's now been defeated. Um, <laughs> and of course, the Naika does defeat him um, and then reveals his identity. And, you know, the, the, the Sultan is amazed. He's so excited and he gives him all kinds of gifts. And he also gives him the title of um, Padshah, of Ikeri. Um, and it's very interesting that the Ikeri Naikas would want that title at all, because I think you yeah. also mentioned that they, they claim another title, which is something about how they're the dam that stops the, the tides of Mlechas from advancing into their kingdom and all that. So yeah. there's, uh, what, what do you think of that? Why, why do you think well, it, they would, how did it, both of these views coexist? Yeah, well, this, this shows how multi-layered uh, and how complex the political situation was. And you can never simply say, um, oh, it was like this, oh, or this is how it works. So on the one hand, um, yeah, the, the Ikeri Nayakas could use that title. Uh, yeah, the, the, what, what was it exactly? The, the destroyer of the Mlechas. The Mlechas in this case are probably Muslims. And it's maybe not so surprising they use this title because they were having these contact, uh, constant um, yeah, clashes with Bijapur, as I just mentioned. On the other hand, um, the fact that they have this story about this Ikari king who went to Delhi and fight this, um, um, and this, this very strong, strong warrior. Um, yeah, it, it also tells us that, that, that Delhi, whether it's the Delhi Sultanate or the Mughals, was a very yeah, important um, focus point, a kind of standard that you that you you as a king 
you you put yourself um yeah you 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 rank yourself in relation to that standard so on the one hand this this story tells me that um the ikiri kings in a way want to uh explain that they are more powerful than delhi yeah? because the king can just go to delhi and he can fight his warrior and he defeats him and the warrior was never defeated by anyone else so this says ikiri is the strongest kingdom of india or at least is stronger than delhi on the other hand apparently they bothered to travel all the way to delhi to do that you know so so why would you do that because delhi is still very important and you sort of want to relate yourself uh vis-a-vis -vis delhi and also the fact that then the story claims that the ikari king got this title of pacha and accepts it it shows well okay we have defeated this warrior so we maybe we are actually bigger and stronger than delhi but on the other hand we still very much want the ruler of delhi to give us this title so in a way he's also still higher than us because he can give us the title and we accept it and so there is this very two-sided uh, relationship um, with Delhi and with the Islamic world in general. Yeah. So, yeah, that story is also wonderful because it has very much has these two sides. Yeah. So it it's not a simple story of oh we want to defeat Delhi or oh we are under Delhi. No, it is it is both at the same time. Yeah. Well, at at least that's my interpretation. I think it makes a lot of sense, Leonard. I mean, um, I, I also think that this is probably this kind of ambiguity mm. towards an overlord is is yeah is it? I think I think it's perhaps like a universal thing. Um, yeah. I think Manu Pillai has this fascinating book called False Allies, uh, which came out I think late last year, where he shows that the relationships of the princely states of British India with the British Empire was yeah. similarly ambiguous where in some ways the kings these kings would want they would crave the approval of the british for acting in british ways but at the same time there's all these like hilarious stories of how of the, of the various ways they would find to try and um show themselves as not being subservient to the authority of the british i think the nizam of hyderabad for example uh, they wanted to award him the star of victoria or the victoria cross or one of those one of those medals i think it was a kaiseri hint sorry my bad but he didn't want to take a medal from the British monarch because that would prove that he is subservient to them. So yeah. like after a month where, you know, the, the ambassadors keep trying to ask him, you know, when are you available? When can we do this? He keeps trying to avoid it. Um, he keeps saying he's busy. He's sick, you know, he ate too much. He's got indigestion. He doesn't want to come to, to, to this uh, medal gifting event. And finally, they managed to force him somehow to come. Um, and then he comes. Um, and I think um, he... I think he takes the medal and then I don't know if I've mixed it up in my brain, but I think he sits on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> something on those lines. Um, just as we are showing that no, no, you know what, you know, these guys may have had the better of me right now, but you know, I'm actually better than them. Um, yeah. and I think that kind of complexity in relationship between um a greater power and a lesser power, as it were, is very important to keep in mind. You know, yeah. it's it, it's never, as you said, it's 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 always going to be too sad. It's always going to be this kind of layered process. Yeah. Um, and I think another example you give of that is about how Maratha dress begins to be adopted after the Bhonsleys take over in 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 Tanjavur. Um, so it, it's not necessarily about oh we're adopting Islamic culture or adopting Islamic culture elements or adopting elements of fashion and style from whatever happens to be the dominant cultural complex and in their yeah. minds as you said once again there isn't necessarily this clear divide between the persianate and the indic which makes a lot of sense because why yeah it's a continue it's a continue exactly yeah 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 that is well maybe that's maybe uh some of the more, more spec uh, speculative uh parts of of my book but um what i notice is that I just, I just explained to you that the Dutch sent embassies to these courts and they report that the, that the kings are wearing, yeah, Muslim, Moorish, Persianate clothes. Um, but the question is what they are actually referring to, because at the same time you see in uh, certain Indian um, images that that this, yeah, this Islamic-looking uh, clothing of these rulers looks 
quite um, like Maratha clothing. Um, so then I was a bit confused, like how can I bring that together? So on the one hand, it seems they are, they are following Maratha fashion. On the other hand, um, we also have reports that it's Moorish. But then what I concluded is, okay, it's logical that increasingly they are following Maratha fashion because the Marathas become sort of the dominant power in, in, in India, in South India um, during the 18th century. Um, but at the same time, the Marathas themselves were also very much influenced by the Islamic world eh? because all these earlier Maratha warriors had been, well, maybe not all, but many of them had been serving um, the Deccan Sultanates. Um, so I think what the Dutch call Moorish may be actually Marathi, Maratha dress, but itself influenced by Islamic dress. Eh? So it's still Moorish. That's why the Dutch recognize it as Moorish. Um, but that's that's my guess. I mean, I, I can't really prove it. Um, but that I, that's that that makes sense. Has yeah, so you I you look to sorry, yeah. you finish that. Sorry, man. No, yeah. So you you try to you try to as a as a court as a ruler as a kingdom you try to connect yourself with the most powerful um, yeah rulers kingdoms at that moment so that it can be the Mughals and later it can be the Marathas and even later it can be the British exactly that's yeah exactly and I think that's actually a, a very good way to see it right? because the the advent of of British power in India is not it's not a break from the past um, at least for the ruling classes it, it's very much a continuity and even for the yeah. British themselves they try to present themselves like the Mughals you know when uh, I think King George the the King Edward the Seventh comes to India. He's on. He's sitting on an elephant, yeah. right? And he's taken yeah. through the streets of Delhi, and they have this whole thing in the red fort and all that. Um, and um, I think this also this 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 idea that there isn't this clear distinction between the Persian and the Indic also makes sense when you put it in the context of court politics, because if in court politics you don't have factionalism based on religion or based on culture or based on um, whatever arbitrary marker, then why would you see that in court dress as well? They simply would not have seen it in the in the terms that. Um, and I think that both these, even though you present them in like different chapters of the book, they both kind of support the same kind of overarching conclusion. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, so my overall point, I guess, in this book is that. Um, that that these courts, yeah, as I said before, they're very competitive, they're very dynamic, um, they are fluid, things change all the time, and that goes against some of the earlier literature, which which is based only on Indian sources, um, where these courts are often presented as very yeah static, very um, hierarchic, harmonious. And so, for instance, maybe a good example is successions to the throne. Um, yeah, quite a number of books that you read on these dynasties, let's say books like A History of the Nayakas of uh, Madurai or A History of the Nayakas of Ikeri. Um, for instance, these successions to the throne are, are often described as very harmonious. And so one king died and everyone agreed that his son would be the next on the throne and everyone was happy and everyone agreed. You know, and and that is that is what, for instance, uh, local chronicles um, often uh, describe, right? Maybe one one good example is um, a succession to the throne in Ikiri in 1661. Some uh, listener just mentioned Shiva Panayaka, which is probably the the yeah the most prominent Ikiri Nayaka. Well, his brother. Um, I think his name was Venkata Panayaka. Um, he succeeded to the throne in 1661. And if you read Indian texts about it, okay, and then one year later, he was he was succeeded by the son of Shiva Panayaka. So from the uncle, it went to the nephew. And that succession to the throne is portrayed in um, Indian sources as very peaceful, as very harmonious, which makes sense because, because those chronicles were um, patronized or, or, or sponsored 
by the descendants of that nephew. So of course they will they will want to present this image of a very harmonious transition, right? Because because they were the descendants of that nephew. But then there's also a Dutch report about this very same um, uh, succession to the throne, which is which was written only half a year after that actual event, and it explains actually how um, first that uncle, so the the brother of Shiva Panayaka was some kind of dictator, well, at least in Dutch eyes. Um, and that actually the uncle wanted to kill or blind his nephew because he saw him as a competitor. Before he could do that, the nephew actually killed the uncle. And so the son of Shiva Panayaka killed the brother of Bada Panayaka. Um, and the Dutch have all these details about how it happened. Well, we cannot be sure of the details because we don't know how the Dutch got that information. They say, yeah, and then the king stood up and then this happened and that happened, all these very precise details. And you wonder how can they know? The Dutch were not in the palace when it happened. So these were just, yeah, stories going around. But you could say um, it was the local view on things yeah, because these were stories circulating among uh, local Indian people. Um, but anyway, even though the details are not true, it, it is very probable that this was a very violent, uh, disruptive succession. Uh, um, but now I forgot actually what the question was. So I was, I was telling you this story, but with a particular purpose, but I forgot. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I actually forgot as well because I was just so lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, what, what I want to make clear is that, um, uh, that, that, that these local sources and the, and the external sources can uh, present very different picture. Um, oh yeah, now I, now I know why I wanted to say this because um, this shows how dynamic and how competitive these courts were. Um, so, so the Indian sources who say that all these successors to the throne were usually peaceful, yeah, that, that's probably not true. It was very often a moment of, of crisis um, where different factions at the court all had their favorite pretender to the throne and, and try to get that person uh, on the throne. And so there was there was always a lot of competition, um, which doesn't make India any different from anywhere else, of course, because this that's a, happened almost everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. That, that, yeah. That's such an important point, Land, because I came across the exact same issue while writing my book as well. Because yes. and, and and the problem with medieval India is you don't have these outsider accounts which give you this other perspective, which might be rather more complex. Yeah. Um, and so you really have to, it's it's very difficult because of course the epigraphic evidence is going to present it in these this very stately, peaceful way that seems yeah. to kind of protect the image of the royal family. But when yeah. you read between the lines, you really get these fascinating uh, like examples, right? So for example, there's what well, there's a mention of um of a Brahmin general who supposedly defended a king when all these other people had turned against him. Um, of course, the king never mentions any anybody ever turning against him in his inscriptions, but the Brahmin general is going to. Um, yeah. And so like, by, by just by cross-referencing these stories, you can bring exactly. out these interesting dynamics. And I think th there's a very strange tendency in, in, in social media, uh, in India especially, to kind of pr pretend that like Indian rulers, especially Hindu, quote unquote, Hindu rulers were somehow of a, of a different cloth than every other king in human history. And <laughs> in the world, uh, yeah. <laughs> which doesn't By the way, sense. yeah, I must say that that is, uh, yeah, I read your book, of course, and uh, that I think that's really impressive that uh, you only have the Indian sources, so to say, uh, for your Chalukyas and Rashtra Kutas and, uh, and Cholas, and you still manage to, to give that more nuanced, uh, yeah, uh, multi-sided, few so that i think that's really an achievement for me it was in a way quite easy because i have these dark sources you know that are so accessible and rich and i mean i couldn't even read everything i had to make a choice for this book so there are whole sections in these dutch east india company archives that i couldn't read simply because i don't have time maybe someone else i i really hope so um, so moving on to a question that I find very interesting, I hope that you will as well. Did the relative dominance of Muslim ruled states depend on their greater use of horses in the military and civil operations and their more widespread horse riding skills? I must say that's a question I, I cannot really answer. I, I don't see myself as a military historian and 
I didn't really, well, first of all, I didn't focus so much on the, on the sultanates. And secondly, I didn't finish so much on this aspect. So I find it difficult to say. I, I think, yeah, I can speculate, but, but probably I would make a fool of myself. So, so, so I find it difficult to answer this. I, I couldn't say why these um, sultan, Deccan sultanates like Bijapur and Golconda were more powerful. Maybe simply because they were much bigger. Uh, um, I don't know if it was if it was because of the military skills, because because I would suppose that whatever special military skills were available in the sultanates would also be adopted by the Vijayanagara kingdoms, because yeah, they would have the means as well, I think, to 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 learn these skills or or purchase uh, war horses. Which they were just... actually. Yeah, Vijayanagara actually bought more war horses than the sultanates. Could yeah, yeah, were... yeah, and 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 also that that single uh, Dutch embassy to the warriors of Mysore uh, that we just mentioned. The main reason why the king Chikadeva Raya uh, Raja invited the Dutch was because he wanted to buy war horses from them, which the Dutch couldn't supply in the numbers that the king wanted because he said, "Yeah, I want to have thousands of war horses." Um, so, so, so I think, yeah, the, the military equipment and, and, and skills, I'm not sure if the sultanates had more of that than the successors, Vijayanagara successors did. But, but yeah, I, I, I cannot really answer. Sorry. <laughs> it's sort of beyond my, uh, my expertise. Yeah. If I may weigh in, uh, Leonard, since I've read quite a bit about this, um, I actually have quite a few thoughts, but I, I I think the simplest way to put this is that I think a disproportionate emphasis is placed on Muslim military victories in India because they're seen as the victories of quote unquote outsiders, um, which is really not the case, you know. Like perhaps if you look at you know the 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 invasions from Central Asia in the 12th century, then we can somehow term them as outsider invasions, but Really, after that, it's really one kind of Indian state competing with other kind of Indian state. Very often, they have much more in common than you might think. Um, Vijayanagara, for example, calling itself a sultanate. Um, and in fact, we have a, a multitude of sources, especially from Portuguese eyewitnesses, um, which tell us that Vijayanagara's cavalry by 1520 was actually superior to sultanate cavalry. Um, so there's a different answer for every single time period we look at. Um, and especially once you start seeing them as this Indian parties fighting in parties, that distinction kind of breaks down. But for the specific question of how did the Deccan Sultanates defeat Pijanagara, the answer is not um, gunpowder. So the answer is not cavalry, it is gunpowder. Um, and even so, Vijayanagara was already catching up. Um, and if you had given Ramaraya perhaps another decade and perhaps made him a little less reckless as a person in life, <laughs> um, you would have seen Vijnagara catch up to the Sultanates easily. It's it's just a question of you know timing and bad luck. And for for what it's worth, Vijnagara was aware of gunpowder before the Delhi Sultanate. Um, and in fact, Babur, when he invades the Delhi Sultanate, specifically mentions that Vijnagara is the most powerful of all the Indian kingdoms. Yeah. Um, so just putting that context out there. And if I may add, uh, neither should we see. The Deccan Sultanates on the one hand and the Vijayanagara successor states on the other hand as, as monolithic blocks. I mean, they also fought a lot among each other. Yeah. So Tanjafur, Ikiri, Mysore, Madurai, they were they were almost in a constant, yeah, sort of not, not always hot war, not a cold war, but something in between, lukewarm war. Um, and sometimes yeah, the one kingdom was stronger and sometimes the other kingdom was stronger. It's the same with the Deccan Sultanates. Um, they started, well, there was first one, then there were five, then there were only three. So in also in these, yeah, Muslim root blocks and in these Hindu root blocks to say a lot of go was going on within those blocks, um, which also had to do with different military skills or... Um, so so it's not it's not a question of this one yeah, religious block fighting against the other religious block, I would say. I mean, simply put, given how much, I mean, the Sultanates, by far, the norm for the Sultanates was to fight each other. There were there was no nobody that 
Golconda feared more than Bijapur. Nobody at Bijapur feared more than Ahmednagar. Um, it was literally only because of Ramaraya's insistence on trying to immediately assimilate them all into his empire within his reign that they all decided to band together and fight against him. And as soon as that was done, they were back to fighting each other. <laughs> Just for once, they came together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, one yeah. time, they all yeah. fight together on the same side. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, coming back to our friends, the Naikans. Um, from Sanchada Dasgupta, very interesting revelations on the continuity of the Naikas to the 1800s and their trade with the Dutch. Is there any mention in Dutch archives about board games played by the Nayakas as a pastime and their influence on Dutch board games? As I've been researching this and it'll be interesting to know. Thank you. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I cannot recall any reference uh, to board games. No. Probably because if the Dutch would have seen it, they, they may not have written it down because it was not relevant. So yeah, I'm I'm sorry after this to disappoint you. I, I didn't see any reference. I, I can't say anything about it. Yeah, but I'll keep it in mind. If I ever come across it, I'll try to track you down and let you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um a question from my friend Pasav Birada. Um, it's interesting that the Naikas in Western Karnataka are sometimes referred to as Kelly Naikas and sometimes as Ikeri Naikas. The origin, of course, was in Keladi, their first capital. Why these two different names and why did you choose Ikeri Naikas? Yeah, yeah. That, that first question is easy. That second question is actually a really good one. Um, Keladi was simply the first uh, capital where it started. And quite soon, in a few decades, um, it was decided that Ikeri was a better situated more strategic place to um, to to yeah to have the capital, and then again 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 a few uh, decades later, the capital was again relocated to um, Bitnur, uh, which is now called Nagar, uh, near Shimoga. And so so the capital kept on moving, um, simply because yeah that was strategically more attractive. Now why did I choose the Nayakas of Ikeri? and not the Nayakas of Keladi. Um, basically because I had to choose something and Ikiri was the capital for a longer period. And it seemed that just a few more books and articles about this dynasty use Ikiri rather than Keladi. But I, I might've chosen Keladi as well. It, it, I just had to choose something. So yeah, Ikiri was more also more closer to the period that, that, that I focus on. So that's all, yeah. But you see it, it's both being used all the time. Um, Sanchita, who asked you the question about board games, um, is requesting your email, um, yeah. if, if that's yeah. something that you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, it's my email address is very easy. It's just my name, Leonard Bess, one word, at gmail.com. And that's all. No full stops or underscores in my name, just Leonard Bess, one word, at gmail.com. And yeah, feel free, everyone, basically, to, to contact me. Love to stay in touch uh, and discuss Nayakas. <laughs> yeah. Um, Vibhu Prakash has a question on um, court factions cutting across narrow divisions of caste and religion. Um, what would these factions be based on? And were yeah. these courts homogenous by any chance? So I think we partially answered that when you talked about how factions supported different successors, but of course they could form for any number of other reasons. So if you could yeah. tell us more about that. Yeah. So these these factions were basically um, based on, on shared interests. Um, and of course, for historians, it can be really difficult to find out, okay, apparently these five guys supported this one contender for the throne. And apparently these four guys supported another contender for the throne. So you see that the factions are based on shared interests. But why these five support this contender and the other four support that contender, that is sometimes very difficult to say. But um, the factions, they were, they were based on, on lots of things. So for instance, um, family networks uh, were very uh, important. So, so you see that factions sometimes continue to exist over different generations. Um, what was also important is 
Marnie, of course. And so there were courtiers that had land in yeah, particular areas of the kingdom from where they generated a lot of money. Um, so they could also buy uh, followers to their faction. So money played a role. Um, what also played a role in the creation of factions is the influence of other courts. So what you see is that, that all these successor courts, and that ties in with what I was just saying, all these courts, Madurai, Mysore, Ikeri, Tanjavur, they're all interfering with each other's politics and they try to create problems, you know, and they support also particular factions. Um, so that plays a role too. Yeah, so so it's it's family connections, it's networks, relations with other courts. Those are I think are the most important factors in these um, in these different factions. Yeah. Um, but never never have I seen that all the Muslims were one faction or all the Marathi speakers were one faction. No. It seems to have been something that us Telugu's were were the only practitioners. Yeah, <laughs> it's really the exception. That's really the exception. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, one last question from Ajay Kumar BS, um, the same gentleman who asked about uh, Ikeri and the gun trade earlier. Hmm. Um, you've mentioned about humiliation encountered by the Dutch embassy as the at the Ikeri court, as they had to wait for a few weeks and sometimes a month to get an opportunity to meet the king in person. Yeah. But I believe it was a protocol maintained wherein the Ikeri king never finalized any deal or treaty at the first meeting itself. Um, why did you interpret these procedures as an insult? At the end of the day, the Dutch were finally given um, the Khilath robes and expensive items. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it, to begin with, it's, it's true that that the, the audiences had different functions. So what you often see is that the first audience with the king is, is more like a welcome ceremony uh, and, and the gifts are presented and no business is discussed. And then if there's a second audience, that is more about, yeah, uh, what the Dutch actually came for. There are some negotiations um, and decisions or concessions are made. And then the third audience is usually, yeah, the, the goodbye, farewell audience where the Dutch receive gifts like um, uh, ropes, yeah, so the prelat ceremony, um, and then they get permission to depart. Um, so, so true, um, it was not possible to straight away start negotiating, but the first audience, which was meant to, to be a welcoming audience, that one would sometimes be postponed for weeks or even months. And that was definitely an insult because what you see is if relations between the Dutch and Ikiri or any of the other kingdoms, if these relations were, were good, the first audience would be granted really quickly, let's say within a few days. Um, so if a court decided not to do that, but wait for a month while the ambassadors were just staying in the capital and couldn't do anything, that, that was definitely an insult. Or also when the, if the first audience would be granted very quickly, um, but it turned out that the court didn't agree with, with uh, the, 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 yeah, the, expect, the, the wishes that the Dutch uh, had for this embassy, then that second audience where, which would see the negotiations could be postponed for a long time. Yeah? Um, so I think you can, you can still say uh, quite safely that that in many cases the postponing of, of audiences was meant as an insult but we also should keep in mind that yeah the, the timing of audiences was only one um, part of the insult that could be offered yeah? so another insult could be that the ambassadors would be invited to sit down before the king and there would be no carpet so they had to sit on the bare floor or the Dutch wouldn't receive any gifts back or um, some of the courtiers would actually say horrible things to the Dutch during, during the audience. Eh? So, so what you usually see is if, if, there's, if there's an insult, um, let's say on one level, for instance, the postponement, postponement of audiences, you also see audience, um, insults on other levels. So it's sort of a whole packet that shows uh, whether the court was happy with the Dutch or not. And of course the opposite. Yeah? So the Dutch could also um, insult 
the courts, for instance, by not bringing gifts. And amazingly enough, sometimes the courts would even accept that because they understood, yeah, the Dutch are angry with us and maybe they are right in this case <laughs> because we just, um, yeah, we just destroyed their factory or something. So yeah, it's not so surprising. And so yeah, that was a game. Uh, and the game was usually based on, 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 on the political situation at that time. So, oh. so I feel, yeah, these, these postponed audiences, they really, yeah, are meant as a, as a, as an insult, as an instrument to show irritation. This, this would have been my interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This would have been <laughs> such a fascinating, uh, such a fascinating, uh, TV show. I was just thinking, yeah. Um, it, 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 I would, I would have loved to like see because it's as you said, it's really like a game, right? And like both the players are like they have this language and like which both, which both expresses and reinforces like particular ideas or status. It's it's just it's just so interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, Prabhu Mudlapur once again um, is asking uh, for your email ID. Um, so that's uh, just Leonard's name. So L E N N A R T B E S at gmail.com. Yeah. And um, in case you meant that for me, it's um, my name, anito.kanisati at gmail.com. Um, okay. So with that, I think that we are done with all the audience questions. Um, I, of course, have a ton more, but um, I've, we've already taken up so much of your time. Leonard, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to spend time yeah. with us. And, talk about these these fascinating fascinating people I was, for for doing this yeah well i was i was very happy to do this this and um um when i worked on this book and yeah altogether it has taken decades i was always hoping that it would also reach a south indian audience because it's about south india um so I'm I'm very uh, grateful for this opportunity, uh, especially to you, of course, Ani Root, for for yeah asking all these very wonderful questions. Um, also, of course, to VIC for organizing this and and for all the people that have watched this and the great questions. And again, feel free to contact me. Um, yeah, and I hope um, now that the pandemic is more or less over to come back to India soon and yeah meet some of you in person. That would be really great. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. It was, uh, it was, a, it was my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leonard and Anirudh, for that fascinating journey into uh, into the history of South India and the details. And it was like Anirudh said, it could have been a TV show, and we would all be like hooked onto it. Uh, uh, Thank you audiences for joining us and for all the great questions. Uh, and uh, from all of us at BIC, uh, an early happy birthday to you, Leonard. And uh, yeah, <laughs> well, all I can say them. Uh, thank you, Anirudh, uh, for being, um, as always, the perfect interlocutor. Uh, and ho hopefully we'll see you, Leonard, uh, at BIC, the venue. Uh, the next time you're here. Yeah. Uh, and with that, good night, everyone, and uh, see you all next time. See you all. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye.